a better um, view. I'm going to get the gallery view and I'm going to record it as we are right now. Thank you guys so much for this uh, first uh, session. Of course, I am in a privileged position because I know you all and you're all my friends as well. So we're just here to share ideas and perhaps um, inspire each other somehow. You know me, I'm Felix Bachmann Quadros. The Bachmann is a Swiss. I use the Quadros so people don't talk to me in German when I'm in Switzerland, because I don't. I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I'm an actor, I'm a performer. I work with virtual instruments. Francesco Carrino is my partner in arms in Host Artist Network. This drives my life, my creativity as well, finding solutions, transforming structures today into something uh, slightly different, finding and defining several aspects and uniting them in my own self. So that's me on a nutshell. So hi to you all. My name is Nicolas. I'm connecting from Buenos Aires, from the old district, San Telmo. I have, I've been working in communications for, uh, I guess, the past 18 years, for mostly my entire professional life. I specialized in political communication. I own a, a small agency focused on public sector communications mainly. I've been doing that for the last nine years. I've focused a lot in, in public policy. That's an issue I'm very interested in. I teach in two different universities here in Argentina, uh, mostly, again, uh, political communication. This was what, a year and a half ago. So in the middle of our COVID pandemic, I started with a new partner, uh, I guess a, a technology company, which is basically providing a platform for video, video on demand and streaming for, for clients. And I've been engaged with the arts uh, uh, along my life. I, I'm, um, uh, I guess, a part-time musician, or it's my hobby. I, I have a band. I've, I've been playing with a band for 20 years now. And I've been engaged in some small theater productions with my mother, who is who's been producing theater for the last 30 years now. And I've known Felix since high school, so very happy to meet you all and, and be a part of this session. Indeed, we share with Nicolas a very stimulating and constant uh, intellectual relationship, as well as our friendship. Hello, everyone. It's, it, again, firstly, thank, uh, Felix, thank you for inviting me along to this uh, wonderful event. It's, it's always good to, to bump heads with, uh, with interesting people and, and to, to discuss issues and whatever really that comes about. So I'm very excited about this. My background is quite varied. I started initially studying economics and, and finance uh, when I initially left school. I did a master's in finance back in the day. I ended up working in banking for many, many years cap in the capital markets effectively. Uh, and then what happened was I had a kind of a crisis of conscience. So I didn't really feel that it was part of what I wanted to do with my life. And I, I left banking and I started to pursue, I was quite creative in that sense. What happened was I started, I went, to, went back to training in drama school and I started working in Dublin as a completely a, a, a polar opposite of, of, of finance and banking. There you go. That's me, really. Uh, and then uh, I ended up in London and I, I kind of studied with uh, Felix in London in, in Lisbon. And, and after Lisbon, after we kind of became acquainted, I lived in London for about 10, 12 years, kind of working as an actor. And also I worked for a couple of charities. So what I do now really is uh, I work in, I lecture in business schools here in France, in Bordeaux. I actually live in Bordeaux now uh, with my wife and, and two children. And I lecture in finance, uh, international currencies. On master's programs, I teach communication basically to business students. So I'm combining my theater training background with my business training. My focus is very much about emotional intelligence, soft skill training, uh, leadership development, uh, that kind of thing, communication styles. Just at the time that I was kind of living in London, uh, the, the financial crash had happened. So a lot of people were kind of, uh, I, I, fr friends of mine were economists. I got involved in this charity, uh, positivemoney.org, and we were basically about educating people uh, about the money system effectively. And I do a whole kind of program on where does money come from. On a kind of a tangent project, I ended up uh, help establishing the Brixton Pan, which is an independent currency in London. And my job with the Brixton Pan was to go around local businesses and get people to convince people to accept a new currency <laughs> as part of their day-to-day -day trading. Uh, now it's 15 years later and it's gone digital. Wonderful. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah, yeah, we'll go into the currency uh, experience. 
hopefully great a little bit later okay so hi from south, south southern switzerland i would say i'm also quite an eclectic spirit my daughter just came in leila can you speak a little bit yeah. hello sagen sag hello hello Ciao. Yeah. lots into filmmaking i'm a documentary filmmaker i would say mainly so i have also an atelier here in um, lugano with, with a friend where we organize exhibitions and various events whatever we find interesting so we jump in uh, i've been also collaborating with felix whenever i could uh, Uh, let's say even a, a music video that just came out yesterday <laughs> and a rock, a rock music video like you know something I have never done before but it sounded fun and it was a, a good project and a good band so we did this and uh, what else um, I would even say late in the last year and a half I got quite uh, Uh, interested in uh, cryptocurrency and NFT and all this new thing that's coming up. A friend who is coming out with, uh, with a series of collectibles, uh, of these, you know, these digital items. And so I'm following it to understand more the process, the, the, all the technical aspects of it and things like that. Uh, actually, I'm also quite, I will say, uh, I'm really open for new new. perspectives because I've done this now for really for almost 20 years and I think sometimes it's just time to have a break and go and find new 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 adventures happens around so it's good to meet people and to see if something new comes up <laughs> novelty indeed that's what we're here for and I think that's part of what's happening today in the world Jan just give us a give us a give us a touch of your background where you're at okay. right now so first of all Hello everyone from Sweden, from the most northern part of this conversation, I guess. And <clears throat> thanks for inviting me, Felix, of course. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's, uh, yeah, we had a chat just recently and I got really curious about the project. And at the same, same time, we realized how much it has to do with things that I'm heading to. Let's start where I'm coming from. So, um, The way I end up here might have to do with the fact uh, that Felix and I, we did a lot of music in the past when I was uh, living in Ticino at the time. Uh, a lot of music with a lot of other crazy people. <laughs> But by training, I'm an interior architect, um, originate, uh, originally from Germany. But my kind of career then developed into to something totally else. I spent a lot of time as a researcher in, um, at uh, Swiss universities. mainly focusing uh, workplace design. And that was at the time before the pandemic, of course. And that was where people were still figuring out like, oh, is, is home office ever going to work, right? <laughs> so it's it's a fun fact seeing us now here. And that's, you know, that was uh, already a bit of my concern in the past. Uh, currently, though, I'm I'm 100%, yeah, 90% manager. I'm, a, I'm, I'm head of the design unit here at Gothenburg University, leading a team of uh, 40 faculty members and 10 PhD students. And we run uh, three different MA programs, one in embedded design, one in design, and one in child culture design, and also a bachelor's in design. So I'm kind of trying to yeah, hold that all together. Uh, but where I'm heading to is getting more back into maybe working on contents, teaching, education, and coaching. Um, uh, I started coaching also other universities when it comes to curricular development, because the higher educational sector is highly in crisis to put it <laughs> soft, to be uh, honest. So where I'm heading to currently from a content point of view in um, um, And maybe that connects a bit to what Connor was was saying about the economy and 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 yeah certain paradigms that also uh, yeah came up there. So uh, I don't know how much you're familiar with uh, uh, Kate Raybert's uh, double donut or the donut economics. So this is something that kind of also gets more and more discussed in the design uh, community. So what I'm currently working on is on models how to combine design and systems thinking. Uh, and how to feed that back into design education in order to avoid that, you know, people or designers mostly are being taught how to become either a very good individual, which kind of, you know, is, is, we're not going to have, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of superstar designers. That's not what, what we need. So there's clearly something missing there. Or people are mostly um, educated uh, in, and yeah, 
into something that I would call solutionism, right? So uh, an application for this, another application for that, a web portal for this and web portal for that, and it's going to solve the problem, but mostly it's not. So yeah, that's where I'm heading to. And uh, again, happy being part of this conversation today and the next sessions too. Oh, hello, I'm Francesco. I'm Italian, but uh, I live in Switzerland since uh, 2008. I'm a professor at the University of Applied Science. I'm a computer scientist. I teach programming, so not soft skills. <laughs> we are looking to teach not soft skills, like <laughs> the exact opposite of uh, So in my day life, uh, I teach how to program uh, microcontrollers. <laughs> uh, earlier on, you, you were talking about you know, the precision of time. So also teach uh, something about this because uh, we timers on the microcontrollers, but I do also research uh, mainly in two fields. Uh, one is uh, human computer interaction with, uh, let's say, uh, a bit more on uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. And the other is uh, data science, use machine learning, uh, artificial intelligence in general. I don't have a focus, uh, let's say, uh, a field in which uh, I work more. The idea is to put technology uh, in the service of other fields. I work a lot with, uh, in the past with the social, uh, in the social field in health. Uh, we work the, uh, with uh, kids with intellectual disabilities or to use uh, virtual reality to train them to everyday life situations, something like this. For me, what's very interesting for me is like to, uh, to have this interdisciplinary project in which uh, technology is just a part uh, of the solution. There is this innovation that came so, a bit from uh, technology. But I like, like to work really with people coming from other fields. Uh, it was in one of these projects that uh, we met the first time with the Felix. It was related to the age uh, people with the, how to use virtual reality, also to inclusion. To, uh, we talked about the ageism. So, sort of racism, but towards age. Thank you so much. That's, uh, there's a lot of information, I think, right now in this room, in this virtual room. I'll give it a shot just to start um, relating ideas. Please feel free to raise hands and ask questions and generate um, uh, uh, and stimulate um, discussion and meeting places for visions to coexist. How value is being transformed today through our relationship to the virtual world and more so in the last 20 years has definitely shifted the way we perceive reality and the way we're relating and the way we're relating issues within our human understanding of things. Of course, more than ever over the last two years, we're living in this extraordinary change and shift. And that has been a sort of a, of a, of a, a catalyst, talking about time, in our relationship with these kind of environments, the fact that we're living now in this, uh, right, in, in, in this actual moment, speaking through Zoom, this catalyst of the COVID and the virus, which is pretty much an invisible thing, attached to technology, which is pretty much something that allows for the invisible to become visible, is generating an opening possibilities. And this is what I'd like to focus on with you guys in the sense of, of course, we need to define a few things. What is value? Where does it come from? What is currency? How is that changing? You know, all these um, uh, possibilities of distributed ledger technologies, all these issues with now non-fungible tokens questions that come about that we can ask each other and see how where does everybody stand about that back in the 1910 this book come out called the rite of passage with this french folklorist called arnold van genet and he coined the concept of liminality which means in the rite of passage which is ingrained in all traditional um human environments we have rituals we have um, rites of passage, meaning changing from one status to another one, right? So um, this liminal moment in uh, rite of passage or in the actual ritual was the actual moment when the structures fall, when what the status that we leave behind us is not, it's not going to be the same as the status that we're going to um, acknowledge or represent as an identity once the ritual is done. Back in the 1980s, an anthropologist and performance artist called Victor Turner took this concept of liminality towards something broader, to a societal environment called the liminoid. 
And this would happen in extreme cases, such as in wars, like the world wars and situations of pandemic, uh, like we're having and we're, we're, we're living today in a global scale. So this is pretty much the first time that we're living this kind of uh, transition entirely as a human species together, not necessarily as a tribe or as a city or as a specific country, but as, as a global human species we're going to find ourselves in a completely different environment. Perhaps thought processes will be different as well. Jan, for example, you, you, you deal a lot with um, um, the way uh, generating design with, for example, hierarchical elements. What is, happens when these hierarchies fall? What happens when elements and, uh, uh, become um, interpretative rather than uh, a result-oriented scenario? No? In a moment of extreme transformation, meaning that we've just merely grasped or scratched the surface of what we can do with virtual instruments, we've been using the virtual landscape pretty much for entertainment and attention, harvesting purposes, communication, but also manipulation, uh, social environments, wasting time, but also gaining the possibility of using these instruments to generate relationships where it would be absolutely impossible to do without. What is it we're at? And how would you uh, define value today? Not necessarily attached to currency, but value per se, even in a personal way. Can I start uh, uh, with one reflection? Because I, I think the less qualified person here to talk about uh, banking, currency and stuff. So uh, before studying engineering, I started to become an accountant, ingegneria in Italy, <laughs> about the supply, uh, how this meet uh, the demand. I think there is not, uh, this is just a part of value, right? because we talk about the market price, I think. Uh, this is something that uh, it was uh, like valued 300 years ago. I think there is not much that changes in this perspective in this perspective, because what changes maybe is that now uh, supply means also to supply something that uh, wasn't impossible, was not possible uh, a few centuries ago, because you can supply something, products are virtual, services that virtual, then we should define what virtual means. And what it changes also is uh, on the demand side, because now the demand is very below, let's say under the shadow of media, social networks, uh, the people that we have in our WhatsApp group. So there is, this is changed, but how the value is defined is also is a part of the value. And uh, we talk about the market maybe, it's this uh, cross break even point between a supply and a demand. I think this is still the same, but what changes the, how we can supply stuff uh, what impact the demand of people? I'm in interested in what you were saying because as, as Felix was uh, presenting the introduction, I couldn't help but thinking, it's just if we were seeing a shift towards our understanding of things as tools, towards uh, understanding them as habitats, right? Like, like the digital environment would provide us tools for us to be connected, inform informated or whatever. I mean, this is kind of obvious, but the way we feel, the, the way we intimately navigate through the experience with technology, I make it, it feels more of an, of an habitat, you know? So give me, let me give you an example. So we would usually, all of, our, all of people our age would go online, for example, in the morning, and just go and check some news, your favorite newspaper or what have you. And, and I think now, you know, it's, we are so, um, we are socializing as we are informed. So barriers are, are, are kind of uh, undefined. And so my point to connect with the supply and demand idea is that I feel as, as all of us spend, and, and no doubt about kids, right, in school, the, in Argentina, for example, they spend the entire year uh, in homeschooling, basically, right? And so now we say, oh, I was at that meeting. Yeah, I did, I, I did participate in your, as if, as if there isn't a barrier or a clear barrier between, you know, the, the screen and the, and the presence, right? So my point is, there's always a, a, a competition for attention, right? That's kind of what communication 
verse is about, but but now it's also about it's not only attention, it's how desirable the the virtual habitat you present becomes. All of us are gonna spend an amount of energy and time of their daily routines habitating uh, virtual spaces, virtual territories, right? Which territories are we going to uh, prioritize? Which, are, which are, are we going to prefer? So I guess there's a kind of a China of our understanding to see how is it that a mix of apps and tools and technologies and hardened software uh, will become kind of the best, the most desirable mix for us to demand. It was Kevin who was talking about NFTs, right? Formerly, I used to work in an art gallery. I'm an lo art lover, contemporary art lover. I was trying to kind of wrap my head around why would people pay, I don't know, thousands of dollars for, for NFT, right? Why would you do that? I spend a lot of my money in, in art, right? But like physical art. I, and I'm a, let's say I'm a very, very small, very modest collector. I would be a big collector if I had the means, right? But why would I pay that to have it online? Well, because maybe uh, we go towards a meeting in which I can display to you guys my digital art collection. So we are all going to habitate, you know, the, the territory, the virtual territory I present to you guys. Trying to figure out what the value is, what's the ideal experience uh, an average user, you know, is going to have. Since we're, since we're like, determined to kind of ruin our planet completely. And I don't see that we're going to see any change in that. So I guess we'll spend more time indoors, right? Because outdoors is just impossible. Where are we now and where are we going? And okay. trying to figure out in communications, in technological services, in the way we deliver, I mean, work processes, work dynamics, social dynamics, how and, and, and where, I mean, Zoom was great for the last two years. Two years from now, I, I'm sure this is, this is insufficient. Very interesting. Just to adhere and then pass on the ball of what you're saying. Evidently, we're transgressing value towards a virtual world. I mean, Gucci is um, um, uh, fashioning uh, clothes only for the virtual. People are just buying real estate. We were talking about this with Francesco three years ago. Virtual reality worlds are pretty much real estate. And that's the actual business model for, for virtual reality. It's, it's, it was always that. It was always real estate. It was always place. The fact that we're transgressing all these values and currency also to the fact that art as a non-fungible token, is it art? These are the questions that this is opening as well. It's, spe it's speculation for sure and finance enhanced instruments, but is it art? So what is art? As we transgress value towards the virtual world, that is opening spaces and generating new values in the actual physical space. And it's also shifting. There are certain things which we value today, like time, just having time to plant your garden, for example, is also partly because there are other things happening in the virtual world. So that is also the way these things are shifting. As you said, I mean, at time, time for me, like when I ask what, what is important, what is, I always say when people say, what, what, what is my luxury in life and what's, what's the most valuable to me? I mean, it's very simple for me, it's time, you know? The time, how can I use the time, how I want to use it, and it's not imposed on me. So obviously, you will ask, okay, why I have been going into uh, the crypto world. I will say I started two years ago. One of the first ideas was obviously I want economic freedom, who probably do 90%. And I entered in a world and I did things I've never done before, like, uh, I say, uh, speculating. You know, you like good projects, and, you know, you move and things, but for what, what means? It's the mean to buy freedom. Uh, obviously, then you have to really go into yourself with time to understand, you know, what does this with you? You know, what, what does this, this, this speculating? This is, uh, it, it, it evoke uh, emotions in me I've never met before because I've never had issues with money. You know, I've always lived like an artist and it worked very well somehow. And, you know, I did, and for the first time I was like, wow, money starts stressing me, but I want to buy kind of freedom. <laughs> but it's like, you know, it got into really, really, it was really interesting because it teached and it touched things in me that I have never felt. So I became a very nice experiment with myself. I looked at myself, and, wow, I, I start reacting in ways I never did. And this does speculating and money. And so it became, 
you get used to a certain stress over time. It becomes less and you know how to deal with it. But then I must say the first time I really started to understand the potential, I would say, of all this world of NFTs, it because it became creative. So I could relate uh, what's probably more in my essence. Uh, uh, I mean, as you said, is it art or not? Or is it valuable? I mean, value is what I give value to. I mean, a piece of gold is why it's valuable because I say it's it's valuable. Okay, then it has its history, it has historic background and people's, but the, the same is with pixels or not. I say, okay, I think this has value. I like it, uh, maybe just out of, of of the beauty of it or any, anyway with nfts you know there's a whole thing with the contracts you can attach to it you can decide a lot what what should happen to even the value that it's attached for example to an nft you know you can say it goes to charity it goes to this every resale uh, the, you know the in our world of filmmakers and so in the royalties you know you have much more power and much more uh, for now, I mean, now this is like the ideal. I mean, even internet at the beginning, we thought it's going to be a great thing and freedom and thing, and we know where it ended up. So, days the danger with the Web three is for me exactly the same. I mean, exactly. it's, you know, we always tend to pervert beautiful potentials as human. I don't know why, maybe because we are greedy. Pacing into what you were saying and yeah. just forking out the idea to Jan and to Connor in a different way. Um, I think it's interesting. You were saying how your experience with NFTs and the way you're dealing creatively with that is changing you somehow as a person. You were talking about that also, Jan, in the sense of <laughs> is, of course, um, we're talking about value in the sense of it's always a common consensus uh, in a community <laughs> to a progression of trust in time, right? That's, I mean, if you want to establish value in the sense of currency, also in the sense of a specific um, element of exchange. So Jan, we're certainly experiencing um, more than ever today the fact that taking care of who you are personally and uh, generating a status of health in your life, in your thought process, in the way you relate, in the way you expunge your creative experience has a value not only to yourself but also to community. So what is that? How, how is that <clears throat> organized? And just before you, before I go to you, Connor, I'd like eventually to go to another question for you, which is, is value essentially and by definition centralized? Okay, so um, let me draw in also two examples by referring to what Kevin said and, um, and Nicolas and Francesco. Um, but first of all, let me lay out maybe um, like a, a triangle of, of relationships that I kind of connect to value to the, to the term value. Rather than a triangle, maybe it's circular and then it's kind of moving away from the center. So if you imagine at the center of the circle is what, uh, what I would define as a perceived value, okay? Um, I'm convinced that something has a certain value to me. We're talking about a collective, a community. We are collectively convinced that something represents a real value that can be different things like it can be material value it can be you know uh, rules that we agree upon right so let's put that at the center um <clears throat> actually that kind of rules is already the, the the second circle i would say it's agreed value right so we agree that uh, uh that piece of paper with written on 10 swiss francs which doesn't exist uh is worth that money, right? Let's say that's agreed, the agreed part. And that can refer to many other things too. And then at the outmost outer part, I would put a circle. And I think that is the one that we mostly rushing towards in many fields is, um, is the illusion of ownership, right? We, we think, we still think that we own anything on this kind of planet, right? And we still kind of believe that kind of thing. And especially in the in the NFT case or in in the virtual space, that becomes quite of a farce, I think. And and now let me pull in uh, some examples. So, one example is if we go to uh, Kevin, who was saying what I really kind of thriving for is or striving for is uh, the freedom freedom to have my time. Now. When you, when you take a look at, I think it is still the most valuable or the most expensive, let's call it like that, the most expensive uh, NFT that has been sold is every day of my life, sold by, um, pro proposed by, the, uh, I think it's a British artist called Beeple, right? Um, but the interesting thing that 
Uh, someone paid, I think, 69 million something for it. Um, but attached to that NFT is a process that uh, people agreed upon with the with the with the person who bought that. That each and every day he will kind of tweak that NFT, that visual part of the NFT that is somewhere available on the net uh, for the rest of his life, right? So behind there is quite an amount of time that is dedicated. So there we have like this kind of relationship that suddenly becomes tangible in some way, right? Let's take another example. The, um, the German uh, art forger Beltracchi, uh, who got arrested, uh, um, spent some time in jail, and then suddenly moved to Switzerland, very close to Luzon, where I used to live, um, and started working on some stuff. Nobody knew what. And now it turns out that he started working on NFTs by proposing 4,800, I think, digital copies of um, Salvator Mundi, which is a painting by, um, uh, by Leonardo da Vinci, that he perfectly copied as well, right? So ex again, there's a reference to what commonly is agreed is a very, you know, uh, is a very valuable painting, right? So again, there is this kind of relationship. Where it kind of comes apart a bit, I think, is when we take a look at what is happening, uh, happening and where, where this kind of illusion of ownership ships kicks in is when we take a look at what is happening with the metaverse, right? So suddenly people are buying into the metaverse, you know, buying virtual space in the metaverse. Um, Zuckerberg at the same time is having meetings with the Pope and other representatives of, you know, spiritual leaders or religion so that in the future people can, you know, um, practice the spiritual or religious habits in the metaverse, which is a private space. It's privately owned, right? Uh, and so none, none of those paying even the craziest amount of money will ever own it because it's owned by a, by a company anyway. So this is like, you know, walking into a mall and, 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 and doing my daily med meditation at Walmart or somewhere. So it, it's also a bit of a craziness going on there. And for me, this is all somehow related to this kind of circle of the, the perceived, the agreed value and the illusion of ownership. And now coming back to your question, Felix, um, why is that inner circle so important? Because of course, and I mean, my, the, the way I treat and develop my own value system, which is then kind of also projected onto what I call the world, that of course establishes certain relationships and the more the, the more I take care about that, the better I can, you know, this kind of inner value system becomes my compass to navigate and to, yes, spend those millions of something on something or not. Yeah. I think it starts with the way you look at the world. Exactly. I mean, if you look at the world saying, I own that space, I own that forest, I own that That's whatever it, it is. And that is what I mean by the illusion of ownership. I mean, yeah. at the very end, we're, we're guests here, right? So this kind of way of looking at things from Absolutely. ownership perspectives leads to a lot of these kind of uh, social and planetary boundaries that, that Rayworth is, uh, is, is talking about. I recently had a meeting with the space conference and they was actually talking about that, the way we're looking at the moon. People are starting to buy parcels in the moon, Mars, whatever it is. The ownership goes, with re the way we relate is through proprietorship. We're still kind of uh, going through life, trying to meet others of our own kind, right? Kind of, kind of trying to meet with our own tribe, right? In terms of our set of values, interests, and so on. I mean, and that's where I think Han has a, a lot to, has a lot of potential, right? I feel there's an insight in Han, which makes you feel that it'll be uh, more acute, more precise, You'll be more able to really spend your physical time with people that are much more like you, you know? And I think that's, a, I think that's still a very intuitive um, and natural and primal, uh, you know, way of, of going through life. Yeah, mm -hmm. being creative. So, Connor, I mean, related to the experience that you've had with, um, with generating currency in communities, because evidently, I mean, th th there needs to be a community to generate that type of exchange. And talking about NFTs, people have, I mean, the birth of the, the web uh, 3.0 is trying to generate um, a complete uh, democratization or actual non 
um, centralization of value. But then it's not really, because then it's, uh, it's apparently peer to peer, but it's actually server to server. And there's, there's all these um, servers that are generating also uh, rules. It's more of a political issue than an economic one. What that's happening right now with cryptocurrency and, um, and um, blockchains. So what do you, what do you, what is your feeling, Connor, in the sense of, you know, how does, how does it, is it really possible to have a sense of value without necessarily having well, a sense of proprietorship and not centralized? I'm, I'm just kind of looking at it from a, from a broader perspective. And I'm just looking from my, just from the, from the history of economics and the history of money. And you, you come from, I'm just kind of looking at a perspective. You talk about value, value means different things to different people. So value means it has very different meanings in different cultures. So what do, what do Scandinavians value? They value maybe more social interaction than they would pursuing your career, where if you're in America, you don't get a holiday for the first three years. And it's, it's what uh, Nicola said earlier about art and NFTs. And I was thinking, oh my God, I think Andy Warhol would love NFTs. Andy Warhol would love the idea of, of the commodification of art, because that's what his, when you look at the Campbell Soup or Marla Monroe, that's what he wanted. He wanted everyone to own it. So in a way that if Andy Warhol lived now, I think he'd be like, NFTs are my thing. It would be right up his street in terms of the way he looked at art in a lot of ways. So the thing about it is, when I kind of look at these kind of issues, but you're looking at the metaverse and aug augmented reality, and you're we're looking at uh, what the you're looking at the, all these kind of virtual spaces that you're you're talking about. How I call me a cynic, but the way I look at it, it's just the commodification of things. So, and it's the continuous commodification of stuff. So now art is commodif commodified to a degree where it's it's pixels on a screen or um, the, it's everything has been commodified. So it, like, if you, if you look at even, even the environment, when say for example, uh, 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 COP26, when they talked about net zero, what does net zero mean? It doesn't mean that companies are not producing any carbon footprint. What it means is that they're offsetting it against, you can buy, you can buy carbon now, you can buy uh, CO2 emissions that companies haven't used that you can then use and then net your footprint because they're not, you're, you're using less than what you're allocated. So therefore, so net zero doesn't mean, it just still means you're polluting, but it just means that I have a friend of mine, she, she lives in Singapore. She trades carbon. That's what she does. This is, so it's commodified. So even the environment in terms of pollution has been commodified. And it really does come back to like, Felix, if you talk about real estate, it, it isn't like the metaverse. It's, an, it's just, an, for me, it's just an, I mean, when I look at it, I go, that's bullshit. I ain't get, getting involved in that. I'm not even on Facebook anymore. I don't even bother with it. But that, I, and I'm thinking, they're not thinking of me. They're not thinking of the millennials. They're thinking of my six-year-old daughter because by the time she gets on social media, that whole metaverse would be part of her day-to-day. -day. And they're the audience they're aiming for now. They're not, they, they're passing us. They're going, yeah, we know you're, you know, we know you, you're onto us. They're passing that now. They're, they're moving on to, the next generation of children who are going to grow up like your children, my children, who are going to go, oh, that's normal. I just put on a headset and I get into my own little world and that's my day to day and that's normal for them. So they're not looking, they're, we're not the audience anymore. They've, they're, they're leapfrogging us into the next generation of people who are not even on social media yet. Because by the time they do get on social media, that'll be the norm. And that's what they're looking at. I know, you know, we're, we're, I, I'm straddled the analog world. I remember when I was, when I was a teenager, when I was like in my early twenties, even the, the internet didn't exist, never mind smartphones. So they know that we're onto this. They know that we, we we're kind of skeptical of this world, but, but it's just the continued commodification. And when you talk about NFTs and currency and getting back to, uh, to what Jan was saying about perceived value, when you look at currency, uh, in the history of money and all money, in fact, uh, money, and it, it's an economic definition. It's a definition of economics in a lot of ways. Is like value is anything you give to anything. So if you value it, then it has value. So the way economics would look at value is this. If you're willing to pay the price for it, that's its value. There, there still needs to be a consensus. Well, it depends. Like when I, when I was establishing the Brixton Pound in Brixton, uh, my, one of my jobs, there was a team of us who did it. And I lived in Brixton at the time. So and a friend of mine is an economist and we said, let's do this thing. And it was kind of a project that I kind of jumped in on. So I went around businesses and we said, right, we're starting a new currency. 
and the Brixton, it's still, it's still there. You can go and have a look at it. Brixton has a very Afro-Caribbean kind of feel to it. Brixton has an identity. It'll only work in places that actually have a sense of identity already of place. Then it will actually work. But what, what gives it confidence is the fact that people buy into it. It's very simple. I don't know if you've ever watched the video about the guy who's dancing in the, in the, uh, at the concert and nobody's doing it. And then the, it's not the guy who dances, the second guy who steps up and backs him. That starts the movement. That's it. That's it. Exactly. It's not the first guy who does something. It's the one that supports him. The heart, it was so funny. We thought the, the easiest sell would be the, the, the bio store you know the the organic food shop the guy with the beard and the hair and he was kind of this kind of scruffy guy in bricks and we walked in he was the last person interested in in an independent currency he didn't give a shit the hairdresser everyone else was interested he didn't care he said i don't, I don't want to i'm not interested in the bricks and pan the whole what was the whole point of the bricks and pan well you go to starbucks you spend five euros on a frappuccino ten thousand calories later of that five euros that you spend in your local Starbucks, probably depending on where you are, but four euros 60 will leave the country. Never mind stay in the local community, it will leave the country completely. So you're not, by, by spending your money on Amazon or Starbucks or McDonald's, you are not supporting your local community. You're not, your local businesses will, will not be, you won't have a local community left. You have a hundred bricks and pans, you can only spend it in Brixton. The idea is that you spend it there. It keeps the money in the local community. You, you create local employment. You create local businesses. It creates, a local, it creates community in lots of ways. There's three independent currencies in the UK now. There's one in Bristol, followed our, uh, we did in Brixton. And then there's a little sh- a village in Oxfordshire that has one. So there's a bunch mm-hmm. of pl- places that do it now. It's not unusual. And by the way, I don't know if you realize it, there's no law anywhere in Europe that's, uh, or the UK that says, you cannot have your own currency. Why isn't there one? There's a very simple reason. It's really difficult to have a currency. You walk into a shop and go, right, uh, that's five euros. They're going to be laughed out of the shop unless someone's prepared to, to, to give that value. And it's, it's exchangeable. Then- and not just exchangeable, but that other person knows that they it has liqui- what's known as liquidity. In other words, they know that they can use this and exchange it for something else too. It has exactly. liquidity. Once something has liquidity then that gives it a market. So when I worked in the capital markets, when new products would come online, like the reason why the, the, mar- the, the global economy crashed through these things called CDOs, uh, collateralized debt obligations, I worked in that business. And what, when I was there in the very beginning for a lot of them and how it kind of really started, not the mortgage stuff, but other ones. And I remember like what people were talking about is that if the market didn't have liquidity, no one would buy them. What given liquidity was the ability to buy them, but also the ability to sell it. That kind of flexibility. And if you don't have that, you don't have a market. It's also, it's also to do with scale. So like with NFTs, the reason why people are in, getting into NFTs is because it's b- building a scale. I remember when Bitcoin started uh, back in the day, I remember hearing about it. With Bitcoin at the time, people were buying Bitcoin to buy shit online. Nobody buys Bitcoin now to buy stuff. People like what uh, Kevin's doing now. Is people are buying Bitcoin and NFTs as, a, as another form of, of speculative. It's a speculative instrument is what it is. You're yes. buying it to speculate, to make money. That's the whole point now. That's what Bitcoin is now. So Let me jump in a a bit slightly, now. Connor, because I think it's very interesting. I mean, there's so much stuff happening right now with what you're saying. There's a couple yeah. of things I want to talk about. I mean, you're talking about currency. This is one of the things I want to shift on your side, Francesco, because we're talking about currency in the way that it's also translatable. What is, I mean, data today is currency as well. But when I, I want to take it a step further, if I might. What about talking about art not as a commodity today? And I think the answer lies in the process. If we start placing economic values on the actual process and not the process as a cost resolving stage of a product, and take the product as a remnant or a residue of that process, which pretty much means of placing value on an empty potential space, right? Not on a structure. If we're talking about a moment where structures are falling today, what are structures? Comfort is a structure. We need to change certain Sorry, structures in order crashed. to generate ecology as well. You know, we can't keep thinking that we can live the same way we've lived so far because we're burning fuel and we're burning and destroying resources because of our comfort. So that is also a structure, right? Oh, oh but, but we can, but we can. Amazingly, we can, right? We shouldn't, but we can. 
I think the, the logic of extractive industries is the same with data, right? Data is not currency, it's, it's raw material. It's raw material. And I'm, it's very interesting how we talk about, you know, uh, mining, it, it's very it dig deep, you know? There's a, a bunch of uh, language, vocabulary is very, is very interesting in terms of extractive industries and what they have done to our environment, to our planet, and at the same time, the way we think about, it, for example, data and what is it that is going to do with our, you know, rights, living standards, privacy, uh, social relations, etc. Right? I totally agree with uh, Nicola because uh, I think that data in itself is not uh, a currency. And also, I think that uh, NFT, in some way. It has been disruptive, but in the beginning was not something that uh, it was intended to be used as it is used now. It's just a tool uh, that uh, could uh, uh, give value to something that before was not valuable or not easy to put value on. An example is uh, like uh, digital art. Anyone can copy pixels, they have uh, the ownership uh, if you want, because I copy my hard uh, disk or something. But the NFT uh, was a sort of answer to if there is agreement, <laughs> go back to the, the agreed value to, to, uh, from uh, Jan. If you all agree that, uh, okay, NFT is true, it's not a farce, we all believe this, uh, we live in this illusion. Okay, there is value because uh, we agree that there is value. But I think the NF NFT, what is interesting is providing, a, a trying to provide a technological answer to this because there is also this data they now are shared. You know, the, the, the blockchain is based on this idea that we all agree that uh, if the majority of people that have a copy of the blockchain say that, uh, an exchange is true, then it's true. Uh, it's something like that. So I think uh, NFT, we can see them like a tool that could provide value to this. Then of course, uh, nowadays, uh, data is value in the sense of raw materials, because uh, working with artificial intelligence, for instance, we need data to work with that. Like, uh, it's like uh, oil. We need this to, to fuel our libraries. So we need to pay for them. But, uh, this is more my perspective. And in fact, artificial intelligence is generating a shift in the way we generate science. Interpretability is taking over predictability because there's an interpretation of data. Like I had a meeting uh, two days ago. Uh, we work with a company and we said, okay, uh, now we have uh, this algorithm, uh, fantastic, can understand your product, uh, what you want to do. Uh, okay, you have this schema in two dimensions. This is this product, this is the other product. The person from the, the company asked, uh, okay, what's the meaning of this axis? What the mix? What is uh, uh, why? We said, there is no meaning. <laughs> it's the system that uh, understood this data in this way. There is not a physical meaning of this. Actually, the, the system understand this in 50 dimensions. You no, know, we try to visualize this in two dimensions. But with no physical explanation. It's this. important for the machine, but not for us. It's uh, wonderful. So yeah. it is part about explainability is very interesting, but uh, yeah. Let me, read, let me read you a quick quote I just read a few days ago by, um, what's her name? Laura Spinney. Contrast how science is increasingly done today. Facebook machine learning tools predict your preferences better than any psychologist. AlphaFold, a program built by DeepMind, has produced the most accurate predictions yet on protein structures based on amino acid they contain. Both are completely silent on the way they work. Why you prefer this or that information? Why this sequence generates that structure? You can't lift a curtain and peer into the mechanism. They offer up no explanation, no set of rules for converting this into that, no theory in a word, they just work and do so well. Let me throw in some, th some provocation here. Isn't that the same thing with art? I mean, let's suppose that, okay, we have now all these systems going on and they're obscure, 
We don't know what is going on in there, as uh, Francesco said, but sometimes we get outputs that we then kind of try to interpret and to curate, right? We become curators of this and that. Well, it's the same with art, you know? We don't understand what was going on there when someone came up with something on this and that. It, it's just kind of came out that way. And then we start, you know, attributing meaning to it, attributing value to it and start to curate it, start to trade it and so forth. So uh, maybe that's a provocation, but I see quite a strong parallel then. So how do we deal with this? Going back, Connor, as well to what you were saying before, I mean, the represented side of uh, the symbolic aspect of art, which is inherently in the process, the product becomes a commodity. But what if we put our, our, our value on the actual process that transforms reality? I mean, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, my mind is going off in a hundred different ways, what everyone's saying, it's really interesting stuff. But I just wanna, I just wanna come back to something. I, I, you, you actually asked me a question about centralized earlier, and which I didn't answer, but I wanna come back to a point that you made about, uh, you made about AI and about uh, information technology, and uh, and and uh, Francesco was talking about uh, machine machine learning and and data and data mining, and Nicola was talking about data mining as well. I, I don't know if you realize it, but uh, uh, Google owns 85 percent of all AI technology globally. Uh, they're buying up anyone who's working in AI. If you want to get a job when you finish, you, you end up working for Google at one point or another, or you, you start a startup and they buy it. And there's a whole area I'm, I'm, I'm really getting my students to look at. It's called surveillance capitalism. And I'll give you an example of surveillance capitalism. You talk about information, about what people know. Like the whole metaverse is like, do we own that space? I think uh, Jan talked about it earlier as well. We are not, we, are, we don't own any of that space. We are, we are in fact the product. So they always say that anything you get for free, you're the product. There was a case, you can look it up in the New York Times, happened about 18 months ago, where a girl, Google knew she was pregnant before she knew she was pregnant. And this is the level of information people are getting at. It's about 10,000 pieces of data. Like when you, Felix, when you're talking about, they know you better and your, your motives. That's the whole point. The idea is that it's about predictive behavior. They're, they're, they're getting all these data points on you. So eventually they can predict your behavior. They're already at a place where they're predicting your mood. I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, Stanford University have developed an algorithm. About in the last year, 14 months, it has a, fa a facial recognition uh, algorithm. And it goes onto your Facebook or your Instagram, whatever you have. It'll pick three photographs of you. What does it could be a photograph from last week, one from last month, one from 10 years ago, one when you were a baby. It'll just select three photographs from that. It'll, it'll facial map you and with a 91% accuracy determine whether you're homosexual or not. This is where it's going with, with data technology. And, and it's about uh, these algorithms finding out what you want to do tomorrow. What mood are you in now? Are you in a mood for a pizza? Your Instagram 10 minutes from now. Another example was Pokemon Go. They're walking around trying to catch these fucking, a, a virtual space that everyone thought they were part of, walking around trying to catch these Pokemons in, in the streets. And you'd see, I remember watching people walking. I was like, what are these people doing? Anyway, Pokemon Go was owned by Google. And that was the game everyone was playing, but that wasn't the real game. The real game, and it was, they use it as a social experiment in a way. The real game behind the game that nobody knew about was this. They were trying to move people around. And what would happen is Starbucks and McDonald's and stuff would pay Google, who owned, the comp who owned Pokemon Go, the, the game, to place uh, what those icons outside its door. So people would like 10,000 or 100 people would go or whatever, catch it and go, oh, I'm outside of Starbucks, I'll go get a coffee. And Starbucks, how they made money was that all these companies were paying Google to put these icons around their premises so that it would get people to go places. That was the real game. Because it's very interesting this part about uh, Pokemon Go. Uh, I work uh, on a European project they exploited the, almost the same idea, but the goal was to promote healthy lifestyle. Like uh, you need to go for a walk if you want to uh, catch your Pokemon to win points, you know, about the gamification. It was about uh, behavior change. We worked with the psychologists working on behavior change to develop this application. They are doing the same to get money maybe. But uh, what I want to say maybe because I'm from the technological side in itself, the, the tool uh, is neutral. 
then it depends on how you use it. Looking at history, when you, when you, when, certainly when a lot of people don't know how the game works. And if you see that, you look at the steps through how things work, like the first stage is, 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 you know, what do you want? Okay, now we know what you want. Okay, now it's predicting behavior. Once, the, once an or some sort of um, entity has, knows more, has 10,000 or 20,000 data points on you, then you're into a realm where what's the next step after that? The next step is control. You start controlling behavior. And Cambridge Analytica demonstrated that when they, when, when they were collaborating yeah, with right. Facebook and they changed elections in a couple of countries. It's called digital exhaust. It's not even information that you, you and I would even, like, do you spell the, the certain word the wrong way constantly? Or, or what words do you search? Yeah, I wanted to jump into what you've said before uh, when you were talking about processes. Like, isn't it much more about the processes? And I mean, if you look back in history, it, and let's take literature and art as an example, in a post Bartiz uh, mindset, uh, we are there since for, for 100 years now, nearly, right? So the, 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 the text is, that really kind of, you know, is written in the mo at the moment when it's read, right? That's what Roland Barthes Barthe wrote in his famous essay and then has been followed up by the Fluxus, Fluxus movement. Um, Umberto Eco has discussed this in his Opera Aperta and so forth. So, so we know that the problem is, or the, 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 the challenge, I would say, with nowadays processes is how accessible are they, are they really for human beings? And this takes me back to what Francesco said, like, of course, that system is, you know, is, is good at, at managing 50 dimensions. We are not. So it's, so it's not a process that is accessible to us unless we kind of, you know, create interfaces that, that gives us access. So the kind of, you know, participation in the process thing is becoming uh, harder and harder the more we, we move on with, you know, certain things. Or another question of yours was like, how do we deal now? What, what strategies could us help to navigate these, these challenges that we were discussing? And, and, and I, see, um, I see a few like that. I mean, uh, one is of course, uh, uh, and that was <laughs> where Nicholas said, like, this is the hardest part, working on yourself uh, and kind of nourishing and cultivating your critical mind and your critical mindset because Nowadays, you know, when, when uh, Connor said, oh, there was actually a game behind the game. I mean, it takes quite some, you know, investigation for, for a normal, uh, you know, ordinary human being to find that out, you know. If you're not into, you know, looking certain information up, you're not going to find that game behind the game. Or as Otto Sharma says in his theory, you, the sources of some structures that kind of, you know, appear to be visible or perceivable in, in, in our world structures. So I would say it, it takes, be, besides the critical mind, it, it takes some strategies of forensics even to, you know, go deep to uh, do a deep investigation, you know, in certain areas of friction in order to really understand what is going on. Um, it takes sure some, um, uh, when it comes to adaptation, you know, to certain things that are happening. And there is a very nice concept that we might pick up later in one of our following sessions, the one by um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, Antifragility. Uh, so how do you deal with reoccurring kind of crisis and events that are beyond our understanding, but at the same time, you kind of need to adapt somehow. And this, the third part, uh, or kind of strategy, it's not a strategy, it's, it's, it's again, it has to do with, with ourselves, is, is an extended concept or not concept extended practice of empathy because that is what is you know getting less and less in all this right uh, or it deconnects us more and more from both each other from you know our living environment and also other entities that we created or that are coming into so maybe that's a bit of a kind of you know take on your question what's what can be done or what can help us to kind of move forward? This technology is certainly generating a sort of oversimplification of our reality, whereas we're living the opposite physically and in reality. We're actually living a complexification of life, putting value in the in-betweens, in the relationships of things like fungi today are being 
um, rediscovered because we realize right now that the whole underneath of the forest is like a miraculous brain constantly communicating because of the fungi, you know? And we didn't know that because we thought that trees weren't really communicating between each other because we're always focusing on the actual structure and not on the relationships. It's actually in the synaptic relationship that we generate memory. It's impossible to, 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 to adhere physically. It's just out in the ether, but it happens and it's real and it's memory, right? So putting our value on the actual process, on the actual empty potential space and the relational side of things, not on the consequential side of things, is somehow the antidote for all this fear of control that we have, even on the economic side of things. It kind of reminds me of, uh, I think I mentioned him before, Otto Sarmer and his theory U that kind of, kind of uh, he, he names three major divides that are happening. So it's the ecological divide. So, you know, we, we kind of, you know, uh, rupturing the relationship with our economy, with the log logical system, the eco-social divide, you know, kind of, you know, and there we're talking about colonization and so forth, biases and, and the spiritual divide, the self-divide from yourself. And, and these are always um, somehow located in, in the kind of tension field or area of friction between what we usually tend to see as the structures. So as you said, like the tree, and we, we, we attribute a lot of meaning to those without thinking enough of the sources, what is going on behind, right? Wonderful to meet you guys. Uh, a lot to think about. Be happy to continue. Many of the is issues were raised today. Uh, I think... Me too, just like Jan, I, I, I'll kind of keep on thinking about this last statement of yours, uh, uh, well, you know, memory and, and trees and, and relationships. It's, I find that it's particularly interesting. As you said, Felix, we're just scratching the surface of the, of the potential also of this new old technology. And, and as I think, um, what I think a lot is like what you said, you know, the, the, how, how can you give value to the process? Uh, there's, there's, there's a key somewhere there in technology and I think especially in NFTs and the fact that you can attach your, your, you know, your contract, your, you, you, you say what you think should happen with it and how should it be. I don't know how yet like these sessions won't go, you know, or can there be something connected to it to make it broader, bring it or give it value. I think, as you said, it's a seed, uh, maybe just planting a seed and we see to see where it grows and i think we all live uh, uh, in a multi-layer world like let's say in the beginning in the base there is the layer that uh, the physical reality and the physical reality is already very complex because uh, we also we only see a part of it through our, our senses but for instance science with the uh, scientific method we try to understand the, how the world works, the universe works, because we cannot see it, we cannot perceive it, we need a methodology. So the reality is very complex. The technology is happening the same, like, uh, I don't know how many of you understand how a computer actually works, what happens when you click a button. It's not easy, we need interfaces. Uh, we go up, up on the level, there is always these interfaces, Jan was talking about interfaces. I think it's very important because the world is complex, the technology will be even more complex, we need good interfaces that are fair and clear what's happening behind. And once again, I think it's really about we have a tools. And if we want to create value with these tools, we have to push it, uh, the, use, the use of these tools in the right direction. Like, I understand there is a lot of uh, uh, preoccupation, like uh, everything, uh, all the data, uh, becomes uh, or belongs to Google and this stuff. I think it's something that we should worry, but we should not forget that uh, in this evolution, like uh, right now, my smartphone is very, very, very powerful. Uh, so we are kind of giving back to the possibility to each user to have the, the computing uh, power that now has. in a few years, maybe we can do all these magnificent algorithms that only Google can run, and we can run it in our smartphone. So we can give it back to the user these possibilities. I think there is a lot of place for this also because we can really open. We can, uh, something was centralized can be 
uh, once again, share everything. But we have to push in the right direction. Uh, of course, to be a bit uh, worried, uh, about, uh, attentive, uh, to have awareness of what's happening uh, behind uh, these uh, barriers. As a final note, I'm just uh, really delighted to uh, share this time with you. I find this valuable, and uh, it's been it's been it's been great meeting you all and uh, discussing these issues. And um, you know, there's so many different points of view. It's a wonderful thing to, to talk about all these issues. And thank you very much. That's all. I, I have so much to think about. So it's just wonderful. Everyone has uh, so much wonderful things to say. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you all. It's been uh, it's been wonderful. A leisurely way of uh, finishing the Sunday for us over here in Europe and for you, Nico. I think you got to go right now. I love you all. You're all wonderful. Thank Artists, you. human beings, creators, <laughs> everything you are. Thank, Thank you. Have a nice Sunday. Enjoy <laughs> the rest of your Sunday. Thank you very much. Everybody. Take care.